folks, and welcome to The Daily Coin. My name is Rory, and I certainly appreciate everybody tuning in today. I have on the line Mr. Brandon Tuberville from brandontuberville.com. How you doing, Brandon? I'm doing okay, Rory. Thanks for having me on tonight. Well, I certainly appreciate it, and we have a lot to talk about, so let's just jump right in. What do you say? Sounds good to me. What happened in uh, Egypt with the Arab Spring? I guess that's been three years ago, four years ago now. That I really, I think that what happened at you know the the people living day to day were able to amass and spread information as quickly as they did, and to make things happen as quickly as they did. I think, and I think that that really took people. It took them by surprise. Well, uh, with the uh, with the Arab Spring, I'm actually a bit of a different opinion on that because okay. uh, a lot of that was controlled by uh, by the West uh, to overthrow Mubarak. And uh, you know, I've done a few articles on color revolutions, and uh, social media was one of the things that they used. Uh, it was one of the things that helped make these color revolutions so successful was that they had the ability to communicate and flash mob and and that type of thing. Um, so it's definitely been put out there with a purpose, though. I mean, I think we can use it uh, to do good as well. I don't know how good we're using it, but... Um, I understand that aspect of it, but I also understand that the other side, I mean, as far as... Because I look at, at Ferguson also, mm-hmm. and there was a lot of people, you know, and I, I understand that, that the uh, powers that be came in there and they had their hands all over it but i also see there was a lot of good that came from what happened in ferguson as well as far as people uniting as far as people coming together whereas the whole goal was to divide and conquer there was that goal was was achieved but there was also there was a i think that there was also an equal backlash of uniting people on that at a grassroots level yeah well certainly things like facebook and and twitter they can be well i i guess I'm, i haven't really mastered twitter as, as well as the other stuff but um you know those things can be used to to bring people together who either are different parts of the country or just right in your own neighborhood that you didn't know were there i've met a number of people off of social media that became good friends so uh, it can be used for you know for good purposes, yes, and that, I think, yeah. And, well, I think that the I think that the the powers that be, well, obviously from from your research and from what you've what you've just said, as far as the the color revolutions and what happened with the Arab Spring, that you're well versed in and how these criminals use these tools against us. One of the things that I really that's really on my mind based on some of the some of the articles that I've read by you is about the propaganda that's going on. You know, as you are, I'm sure you're well aware that propaganda was legalized in this country, I think two years ago or three years ago. Mm-hmm. And it's now one of the greatest weapons that the MSM and the federal government use against us, just the ordinary citizens. And I've long argued that the typical American citizen, the blue collar crowd, they're so beat up at the end of the day, just like you're coming home from work. And I used to come home from work and I would just be beat up, but I had a determination that most people don't have. You have that same determination that most people don't have. And they just have little capacity for the research of the type that we have dedicated ourselves to doing. And I'm not making excuses for any of for anyone. We as American citizens have a responsibility to our country, to ourselves, to stay informed. But unfortunately, most people get their information from TV and radio. And how do we break the cycle, Brandon, and get or begin invading the living rooms of the people that are hypnotized by the Kardashians or Dancing with the Stars? Or how do, how do we reach them? Mm, uh, that is a good question. Uh, <laughs> I wish I had an answer to that. Um, 
You know, it's it's very it's very difficult. I mean, all you can do is is try to get people one on one. But at the end of the day, that television is the biggest weapon that that they've ever invented, right? And um, if you can't get people away from that, I mean, how to get people to do it on a mass level? To be honest, I'm not sure you're ever going to get people to do it on a mass level. But if you could get the the right amount of people who were active, you know, the people who do question things even throughout all the propaganda, then I think you might be able to affect some change. Do you, are you seeing any change? Is your readership going up or are more people picking up your work from around the web or what are, what are, what is your personal experience as far as people awakening at this point? I, I feel like there's more people waking up uh, to what's going on and, and paying attention at the same time. I feel like there's another, uh, you know, just about an equal amount of people who are almost regressing. Uh, and, and getting worse, uh, you know, becoming more, you know, I don't know what the militant in their, their ignorance. And, you know, I, I do think, unfortunately, there's so many traps for people who wake up, the things that they can get led into, uh, get off the, the beaten path, you know, or, or the, the narrow path, you know, and then yeah. they can be dragged off into outer space somewhere. And, um, you know, it's, it's very difficult. I mean, I, I I do see more and more people who are coming to an awareness that, you know, that wasn't present before, whether maybe not fully, you know, maybe some people approach it in different aspects and different locations, different, you know, corners of, of all this stuff, some natural health, some politics, some, uh, you know, uh, anti-war protest or some just in terms of the whole consciousness thing or something, you know, that, but uh, you know, a lot of, but I think a lot of people are simply going back into the system and regressing. And I still think there's an overwhelming majority who just don't care. And, you know, and I don't I, think we can make them care. That's, and, and thank you for that because that's, that's, that's what I see. I see a number of people or I see more people asking questions. That's, I see the same thing. I see this regression into more of a militant stance of ignorance that I'm not going to change and, and I don't care what the facts are. I don't want to know what the facts are. I know what I know and that's all that matters. And your, your article, you know, American sniper. Yeah. Lies and propaganda. Yeah. Uh, American sniper lies and propaganda to divide a nation. I mean, I think that that is a great microcosm of, of what, of the question that I ask. That, that the propaganda is getting is getting so thick at this point and it ties into the social media which is what we were talking about a minute ago and, and speaking of uh of american sniper you, you did a, a, a great job uh with this article and just how do we get people to see just because i don't think that chris kyle was a good person i think he's a murderer that that doesn't mean that I'm not a, a good citizen. I mean, is that is that possible, or is that in the same vein of what of what we were just saying? Uh, well, I guess it depends on who you're talking to. Uh, you know, I just uh, some people are not going to come to that conclusion ever, and I think some people have to kind of witness it up front. Uh, they have to see. The, the the repercussions of what they've been supporting before they realize that they can't support this anymore, and um, you know I, I've actually known a lot of veterans who would share my opinion and do share my opinion about Chris Kyle and about the war and about you know how I approached the article, but uh, you know the the ability to to break through that propaganda, you know. Um, Especially if someone's been in the military, because it's not just media propaganda for someone who's been in the military. It was drilled into them, and then they went through a horrible experience if they ever saw combat. And you know, that's you know, you're you're really asking somebody to to kind of break through an enormous amount of propaganda and training that you know it can be done. But if, if there's a method to do it, I'm not really sure if there's a method. One of the things that that's that's really has been bothering me for a couple of weeks. I, I wrote an article about three weeks ago called "Propaganda 101: um, Operation Mockingbird Continues," 
And in that article, I was citing social media and the importance of it. As far as the as far as what you and I were talking about a minute ago, as far as it being a weaponized propaganda tool for the uh, powers that be, and it I just see that being one of the absolute strangleholds on our society because I don't know if you saw or not or, or aware of the uh, Ask the White House. Twitter campaign that they did like two days after the State of the Union. Did you see that? No, I didn't see it. I can only imagine. Oh my God! It was <laughs> uh, anyway. Um, I, I did an interview with uh, Eric Dubin over at the News Doctors, and it was the day after that it happened, or it was maybe it was the day of. But anyway, we captured. I captured a bunch of the photos from these so-called leaders. And they had people from the State Department sitting there. And I'm, I'm not joking, Brandon. They had on the cheesehead hats. They had on the, the cheesehead uh, neckties. And it was and the, the whole thing was called um, Day of the Big Cheese or, or something along those lines. What? Exactly. And these people were going... And you know, Twitter is, is global. It's not just... Right. And so we've got photographs of people from the State Department and from the Office of the President that are going out to the world, and they look like clowns. And that's actually how I described them. I mean, it's like, a, it's like a clown show. And Twitter is 140 characters, including spaces and punctuation. And this is how they're... This is a huge part of their communication to the masses. I'm bringing all this up because of the impact that it has on what you and I are trying to do, which is we're trying to get the truth out. And typically, you can't write an article that conveys an idea or a message in 140 characters or less. Right. It's well, you know, Twitter is all about linguistic minimalism, which which was the goal to begin with was was to reduce language. And the English, for instance, is already a sort of devoid of of a lot of concepts that other languages have. So it's already sort of a minimalist minimalist language. But then you you have something uh, you you have a concerted effort through public education and so forth through, for years to to minimize what individuals are able to convey and then you have you know uh, uh, different types of music television cultural uh, uh, memes that are put out and then you have things like Twitter which all reduces the amount of, of words people can use to convey an idea and eventually you're not able to convey that idea uh, appropriately so eventually you get an, you get an article that's you know, 1,500 words, which really isn't that long right. of an article. <laughs> right. And people can look at it and say, oh, my God, you know, I'm, I'm not reading that. I don't have time to do that. And and, and that's what's so unfortunate. Uh, this stuff was all scientifically done. I mean, I, in some of my articles about color revolutions, there there is uh, mention of an individual who was working for the military, and I don't remember his name right now, but he was working on uh, using television as a weapon which of course it was it has always been used as a weapon but yeah. he he was looking at using that for the purpose of color revolution specifically and he used um, the first music video to uh, to use that as sort of a blueprint and that's that's what you see with social media as well and it, it could be used for so much so much good um yeah i think probably the best decision would be to not join up on this social media but if you're there, you know, it could be used for so much good. As I said earlier, I mean, we've, I've met people who became good friends off of social media and we, we, we get our ideas across too, but this stuff was uh, designed. It wasn't designed to help us. It wasn't designed to be sort of a product that people just make money off of. This stuff was heavily connected to the CIA, um, uh, not just uh, Facebook, but a lot of these social media accounts, all this stuff was put out there for the purpose of sucking up our information and and essentially doing letting us do what the CIA has been trying to do and the US uh, NSA has been trying to do for the last 50 years and now they don't have to really 
monitor all of us. We just give it to them. And that's what's so, that's what's so sad. We just keep, we keep, we keep doing it. And with the ability to communicate, and, and again, this has been written about too, the uh, social media is a major tool for these color revolutions. And there, there can be good connections out of it. But, you know, unfortunately, I think there's so many people who are, um, who are hooked into it, who really aren't using any of the thinking parts of their brains that, you know, I'd really, I really think the, the bad outweighs the good in this, this situation. Only because we allow it. Well, we allow it. Yeah. Only because we allow it. And personally, I think that, that social media can play a huge role in tipping the scale. If we use it for the good, because I, I, I'm sure you've heard before, you know, it just takes one match to eliminate the darkness. And, you know, the tagline on my uh, website is setting brush fires of freedom in the minds of man, which is part of quote from Samuel Adams saying it does not take a majority, but an irate minority keen on setting brush fires of freedom in the minds of man. And that's the whole idea. And that's what I want. That's how I want to use social media is to set those brush fires and to get the information out there to offset what these guys are, are putting out. Can we do it? Don't know. I know that, that we have the power and they don't. We give them the power. Thank you very much for putting Twitter in particular into the proper context. I knew that Twitter came was a CIA piece of software because all of a sudden it was everywhere. It was nowhere one day and you couldn't get away from it the next day. And nobody does that except for the government. Do you, are these guys just studying relentlessly uh, Edward Bernays and 1984 and um, Goebbels? I mean, are they just, is that just the playbook that these guys are using at this point? Well, in a way, yeah, but th- but this this goes back. I mean, you know, this goes back much further than uh, Goebbels or uh, Eric Blair or um, uh, Edward Bernays. I mean, these guys. I mean, uh, George Orwell, Eric Blair. He he was he was an insider himself. I mean, he wasn't really he wasn't writing a manual. He was writing in fiction what he witnessed as an insider. I mean, he was a uh, major socialist who went to, uh, to Spain to help fight in the Civil War, and he realized that the socialism that he was supposed to be promoting was not exactly what he was seeing on the ground, and he went back and basically uh, reported this to the groups that he was in and was told, you know, shut up, this is exactly what we wanted. And uh, he, he, he figured out that this uh, the system was to be, you know, essentially what he created as the fictional world of 1984. And uh, which I think the original title was supposed to be "The Last Man," uh, hmm. not 1984, because the, the the last man would be the man who could still think for himself and still question authority. There wouldn't be any other men that could do that. And the publisher changed it the last minute and changed it to 1984 because that's 1948 in reverse. Right. But you know, uh, you know, even Bernays w- was not the initiator. I mean, he he served. He helped governments. Uh, many governments get into wars in terms of uh, propaganda, propagandizing the public. But he was really just using techniques that had been around long before him, because he he had uh, he had studied these things as well. I mean, uh, before Bernays, there were there were many wars that used propaganda to get uh, to get the the, the public. Uh, riled up and ready to go off and fight. There were many changes that were made before Bernays and Goebbels. These guys were just implementing propaganda that had been around a long time. It, it just It's mind-boggling how deep the rabbit hole actually is. Rory, I'll tell you an example. I mean, this is, this is not ancient history, really, but at one point, the British government had, had propagandized their, their citizens to believe that the French... Were animals, and the French would come come eat their 
brains out if they ever entered England to the point where a ship had wrecked off the coast of, of Britain and they had these monkeys in cages. I think they had captured somewhere in Asia in Asia and the uh, cases washed up on shore and some of the monkeys got out and some of the people actually thought they were Frenchmen. Oh my God. And this is before television. This is before the vast majority of the public could read. So this is not, again, this is not really, this is not new at all. I mean, Plato discussed uh, propagandizing the public. Uh, he, he discussed having musicians uh, licensed because he knew the power of, of music over the, the public. He knew that certain types of, of music could produce certain types of emotions in, in people. And for that reason, he wanted musicians licensed and only to be approved by the oligarchy that ruled um, his, his, his area because he didn't want the ability uh, of, of average people and the musicians to be, to be able to, um, to overthrow the oligarchy. So he wanted to use that for propaganda purposes, and it was. It was used. They, this is the th same thing that was used in different types of theater, um, back as far as Plato, but in, in England, you know, they had the morality plays and that sort of thing. So it's, it's propaganda didn't start with Bernays by any stretch of the imagination. No, but he kind of brought all of these ideas together and put them into print that is still out there where most people can get to it. And a lot of people do get to it and can see through it. Yeah, he, he kind of refined a lot of it. He had a lot more to work with, too. He had a lot more uh, wide-reaching media, newspapers and radio and that sort of thing. And, uh, yeah, he, he put a lot of that stuff down that people can go and read. But now it's even more refined because we, we kind of we, – we've let ourselves into the trap now, now that we have televisions that are – Specially designed in terms of flicker rates to, to put the brain in a hypnotic state. I don't know if people really understand that, but every time you sit down in front of that TV, your mind is being psych you know, scientifically put into a hypnotic state because of the flicker rate on the television. And every time you sit in front of that box and watch a television show, you're being downloaded with propaganda with the information that's in those television shows. And the best way to get an idea across is not to tell somebody the idea, it's to put it in a story. That's been known since the beginning of, of uh, recorded history, right? You want to get an idea across, you tell a story with characters that, that you know mirror your situation. That's why you have sitcoms and soap operas and dramas and all of that kind of stuff. And that makes perfect sense. Yeah, I, I, I personally, I don't watch a whole lot of television. I do, I do watch. Uh, some, I'm not going to lie. I mean, it's, uh, it's a form of escape for me. You know, it helps me to unwind at times when I need it. But, um, uh, and I'm well aware of the flicker rate and what's actually happening. I do understand that it's sucking my brain dry and helping to, um, numb my critical thought processes as well. Which is one, which is what I wanted to ask you about, as far as um, the social media with text messaging, in particular, this and Twitter, those two working in tandem with each other. And you had made reference to how uh, Twitter is just, you know, it's just brought down, stripped the the language, and text messaging. It started really, in my opinion, it started with email. It started really hammering on the language that we use, which directly impacts critical thought and then moved into text messaging and then the unleashing of Twitter. In your opinion, or maybe you know this from study and research, is, is that by design as far as those, those three steps working in concert with the indoctrination system of public education to completely nullify critical thought? I mean, is that the goal? Yeah, it is the goal. Uh, it's the goal to have people who can follow instructions at the basic level to do a job, maybe, but uh, not so smart as that they can question anything. And in the meantime, indoctrinated with all this different type of uh, uh, you know, propaganda in terms of uh, social uh, and, and cultural ideas that 
either you know it should be left to the parents or shouldn't be really taught at all but yeah it, it is a progression you know it, it, in terms of not just the schooling but as you mentioned the, the progression from maybe letter writing to email uh to to twitter and that sort of thing and that's you know, I'm not going to argue that we shouldn't have those things. I mean, uh, imagine if you and I had to have communicated via the post office, you know, if I, if you had to write me a letter and then I had to write you one back. I mean, I'm not saying that we should hinder progress, but we also shouldn't be naive as to what it was created for. Um, it wasn't really for our benefit. I mean, the, the, the uh, DARPA created the internet. Yes. Uh, so people should remember that, I mean, DARPA is the defense uh, department essentially, it's the, it works on weapons and and uh, methods of war. It doesn't work to uh, give sight to the blind, and it's not interested in that. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's interested in uh, killing people and and imposing police states on them so that they don't get out of control uh, for the benefit of the state. And they didn't release the internet so we could have stuff to do with our time or so we could learn about history or, or become politically active. They released it for other reasons. That's why there's so much, there was so much porn on it when it came out, you know, that's, that's why they just can't find out how to get rid of all this porn. And, uh, you know, it was, it was put out there <laughs> as a toy, you know, yeah. you go on, you and I are going to go on the internet and we're going to read about the federal reserve. We're going to read about uh, history and we're going to read about what's going on in the world. And we're going to care, but that, vast majority of people are going to go on there and watch porn and Kim Kardashian. Yes. And, Same thing. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you mentioned the, we, we were both mentioning the, the difference between some people who are waking up and some people who are regressing and the vast majority who didn't, you know, who, who are not paying attention at all. And, and the American sniper article that I did you can look at a microcosm, just look at the comment section. There are some people who, who know what's going on and, and they're demonstrating that they know what's going on by, by what they're saying. And there's some people who have completely regressed and they're so full of anger and uh, hatred and, and just propagandize ignorance. And then there's the overwhelming majority who never read my article, didn't even know it was there, didn't comment, didn't have a clue of what was going on. So that's sort of the microcosm. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the uh, that's kind of the the shame of of what we do is that we do all this work, we we spend all this time doing all this research and deliver it, and you know, ten thousand people read it, or you know, or twenty thousand people read it, and there's. 310 million plus people in this country and you know all we can do uh, brandon is just keep plugging keep plugging because my goal my goal with uh the daily coin and i'm sure yours as well one of your goals and with uh brandon tuberville.com is to continually reach more people and to uh, help them to awaken help to bring them into the light as far as, you know, we need them. You know, I don't, I don't call, I don't call them sheeple. I don't call them ugly names. They're just people that are confused. They've been lied to all their life. Their whole life is probably a lie. And it's not, I don't really see it as being necessarily their fault based on some of the things that you've said. Yeah. I mean, I, I've heard, uh, I've heard Alan Watt, uh, describe it as, uh, breaking the legs of a cow and then kicking it because it can't get up. You know, exactly. it's like, uh, it's, it was done to them. And so to, to just be, I mean, obviously you get angry at people sometimes you can't yes. help it, you know, uh, but you know, to, to look down on people as if we're some type of elite, uh, group of people here that uh, everybody else is just scum and sheeple and stupid. I mean, I, I, I don't think that's the the right way to a- approach it. I mean, what if somebody had looked that you know looked looked at us that way years right. ago or something? And and also too, I mean, I think one of the things people should remember is that there is a life outside the internet, and you know maybe you shouldn't go running up screaming about you know, chemtrails and uh, vaccines and uh, GMO food and war all at one time to somebody you've never met at the <laughs> convenience store. But 
it doesn't hurt to actually speak to a human being and uh, you know not be afraid to to really say what you think and I, I've tried to to talk, talk about this on on my radio show before which is you know if you're it depends on what your talents are if you're a good writer then maybe you should write uh, if if you're a good speaker then maybe doing some talks um, around town or trying to get on access radio or something, access TV, whatever your talent is, you know, put it to good use and try to get the information out there. But the internet is a big part of it because most people are hooked up to it. But there's also a world outside of it that we, we have people who are friends and family and neighbors and even people we don't know yet who we could be talking to. And again, I don't mean like overwhelming them with all of this information at once, because that just makes you look like a crazy person and nobody (laughs) is really going to be able to grasp all that stuff at once. And, but, but, but planting seeds here and there, you'd be surprised. You might actually meet people who are aware too, you know, and, uh, or you might, you might really, you know, set off the, uh, you know, light the fire. That's really going to, really going to start this whole thing up. Yes. You never know. Well, I mean, what I, and what I found, I mean, in the, in the job that I was doing, I was in retail and in the store that I worked at was a grocery store. Everybody has to eat. So I was in contact with a great number of people and the store was actually physically located, uh, Brandon, right on the line of the haves and the have nots. And I'm not joking. You had people that were, on food stamps on one side of the road and you had remnants of the middle class all the way up to the elite. And I'm not exaggerating. And it was incredible to, to interact with all of these different people because they all have questions. They all have the people that I ran into a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them, once you, once I would get into a conversation with them, it was incredible to see and to hear that they know that something is wrong. They don't know what it is. They don't know how to, they don't know how to ask a question about what's wrong because what if we've been taught all of our life? Well, you don't ask questions because you look stupid. That's what I was experiencing. And that was for the, last four years and the interactions that I had with people is pretty incredible. Has that been your experience as well? Um, not, I mean, I I wouldn't say that necessarily. I think it, it kind of goes across the board in my experience. I've seen people who were, you know, from all across the board who would sort of innately know, that something was wrong. Again, maybe not know how to put it to words or not know even the questions to ask. Right. But, or, you know, certainly couldn't articulate it, but just knew fundamentally that something was wrong. And when they sort of found out what it was, it made total sense. I've also seen people across the board, as I said earlier, who don't know that anything's wrong, um, couldn't care less if it was wrong. And uh, some of them would probably sign up to be on the other side if they had the opportunity. So, you know, it's, I, I really think, uh, you know, I don't really think we should. Uh, Generalize. I, I really, yeah. I mean, I, I think there's, it goes all the way across the board, to be honest. It's amazing to me how once, once you get away from the internet, once you get out of your house, once you get in and interact with people and actually interact with them, that there is, in fact, a lot of questions out there. And, and like you said, they don't know what the question is and they, and they sure don't know how to articulate it, but they know that there, but they, they know that there is a question. There aren't any jobs, but they tell us that unemployment is, is low. Why is it that they say that there's no inflation, but everything in the grocery store just went up? Yeah, and and that's the that's the interesting thing is that sometimes you can say that to people, and sometimes people those same people will look at you and go, "Yeah, that, that's a good question." They, you know, nobody's got a job, but they say there's only five percent unemployment, and they they start to think about it. Other people you can say that to, and they go, "Well, I mean, you know, it's just 
it's 5% unemployment. That's what it looks like. <laughs> the other percent <laughs> uh, couldn't care less. They just, they say, oh, whatever. I don't care what, what's on TV. And, yeah. and that's just the way it goes. I mean, the, the trick is to find those people who, who will look at that and say, yeah, wonder why, wonder why they are telling us that and really think about it. And that's the person that you want to stick with. That's the person that you want to keep feeding information to. I mean, I'm not saying that we have to give up on the others, but, uh, you know, th- those are the people that you got to focus on, the ones that have that, that little spark that still that hasn't been put out yet. Yes. You know? Yes, that hasn't been drowned out. Well, Brandon, I tell you, it's, it's, been, a, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. And if you would, give yourself a shout-out and tell people how they can find you and, and tell them about what you're doing. Well, um, certainly they can find my articles at uh, activistpost.com. I also write occasionally for the antimedia.org and naturalblaze.com, but I repost all of those articles over at brandonturbeville.com. And I also have a radio show that is one hour a week. So it's on ucy.tv. It's called Truth on the Tracks. And I also repost the archive version of that show on brandonturbeville.com. I've got a few books out as well. One of the books is called The Road to Damascus, The Anglo-American Assault on Syria. It's about the Syrian crisis and it goes through that crisis from the beginning until uh, largely to where, where we're at, at at this point. And you can find that at the uh, website brandonturberville.com as well. Well, that sounds great. And I, but I appreciate all your time and I hope that we can do this again, Brandon. I really do. Well, absolutely. I enjoyed it. Well, and you have a wonderful evening, and I will talk with you again soon, my friend. All right. Thank you. All right.